Greetings, viewers, and welcome to the show. Say, you remember that one movie a while back called Casper? A lot of you may remember the 1995 Casper movie. And we all know about the Nostalgia Critics review of it from a couple years ago, but did you also know they released a couple of direct-to-video spin-offs of it? The first one being in 1997's Casper, A Spirited Beginning. A humongous piece of shit that most people have probably never heard of, and after seeing this review, will probably be glad they didn't. The film was distributed by 20th Century Fox's home video division. Now, that's a good sign of things to come right there. So let's take a look at Casper, A Spirited Beginning. We start off with a string of commercials of shit most people don't really care about, until we eventually see the Saban logo that starts the film. So the film starts with this extremely long opening credit sequence that takes two and a half minutes to finish. Was that CeeLo in the background? Also, is that Will I Am? So after the extremely long credit sequence finally comes to a halt, we see some haunted house area, then suddenly some train tracks seem to appear out of nowhere and a ghost train appears. Sheesh, way to throw us into this world with no explanation movie, especially considering we've never seen anything like this in the first film. And inside the train, we get to witness probably every stereotype the writers could possibly imagine for ghost characters. This crying ghost most likely went into a state of depression where she killed herself. And this sneezy guy here most likely died from some disease. This angry guy must have got an anger-induced stroke and fell into a coma and never woke up. And this surfer dude, well, if you know how surfers' lifestyles are like, you probably know how he died. And then, of course, we meet Casper, who somehow doesn't have any idea that he's a ghost, mainly because of the way how he responds to everything around him. Wake up, Casper. Come on, snap out of it. He asks each of them on the situation, and we just get greeted to some ghost puns. Yeah, scram, Debbie. I'm in a grave mood. Where's this train going, lady? The processing station. Now let me rest in peace. Then, when he gets to the surfer ghost, he finds out he's a complete douche and throws him right out of the train. After God knows how many hours of floating around, he somehow stumbles onto this neighborhood called Deeds Town. And here we get to see Ben Stein doing another cameo in this Casper film. And, something that we've never seen him do before, showing some form of emotion. And this somehow leads to a chain of events where the entire neighborhood ends up running for their lives over this cute little ghost that does not look in the least bit threatening, nor does it seem like he will even try to kill them. Okay, how did he only realize now that he was a ghost just as he looked downwards? Don't you think he would have known he was a ghost the minute he got on that train, considering all it took for him to realize it is looking down at his feet? Also, I think this little girl didn't realize she wasn't supposed to reappear again. And somewhere else in the neighborhood, as we listen to this not Hanson ripoff, we find our secondary character, Chris Carson. A kid who's really into sci-fi and paranormal stuff. And here we meet his dad, played by Steve Gutenberg, who somehow looks very different in this movie than he usually does. I mean, what the hell's with the beard and the mustache? Wait a minute. That's evil Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> And here we find out that Chris and his dad do not exactly have the smoothest relationship. The first phase of my plans for the renovation of the town, and the mayor loves it. But I don't like that old mansion. It's really spooky. No more supernatural stuff. Don't forget, tonight's my open house. Here for me and Tori. And don't slam the door. And here we come to see a group of protesters right in front of the Applegate Mansion, being led by Sheila Fistograph, played by... Becky from Full House. 
boy, they sure pulled out all the stops for this star-studded cast. Here, during this major protest group, we see the ghostly trio doing their best impressions of a particular string of 90s commercials you most likely heard about. But why sir? But why sir? So the ghostly trio then decide to possess the local bulldozer in order to do the one thing they do best. Create total chaos. Look at these weird sheep special effects. <laughs> I learned this trick for my money. <laughs> it's a Pumpkin Guys party! <laughs> <laughs> that should be the weakest party favor sound I've ever heard. It's almost like they got a defective one over at Dollar General's or something. <laughs> this is a no parking zone! You know, the really sad part is. Somebody actually had to buy and or loan over this car for this production of a direct-to-video piece of shit film for kids. Before you run off, pal, you better check under there. Under where? Exactly! A mega onesie! What a crack-up! Okay, is it just me or is that guy enjoying that wedgie a little too much? Okay, how did he not notice any of that ruckus going on just outside? And here we meet the obligatory bullies of the movie. Look, creepy Chris Carson. Get out. Chris is reading about himself. But before the bullies can start kicking Chris's ass, they run in terror by the protesters who are running from the ghostly trio. And apparently, Chris Carson knows them. Definitely the work of the ghostly trio. This I've got to see. Dave, it's Tim. Where's my crew? Hey, quit! Adios! Reservoir! Dave, I need this house down! Well, then, you've got two options, Tim. Find another outfit or start huffing and puffing. Look, you're the last demolition crew in town. If Mayor Hunt is not posing in front of some rubble today, I'm dead! Tough. We don't do ghosts. Union rules. Dave, there are no such things as ghosts! Dave? We then cut to the ghostly trio celebrating their recent victory at the protest alley by listening to even more ghost puns. Just like the U.S. Scare Force. They didn't even stand a ghost of a chance. Them fleshy sure can run. Oh, I'll say. Maybe they take extra vitamin E. <laughs> well, maybe we're just the best. Chris then appears and takes a picture of the ghostly trio. And this scene basically establishes that they've known each other for quite a long time. Hey, it's that Snoop again. Who is you? Nosy! Nosy? You mean this guy? Nice try. Ooh, it's Mr. Scare Me Not. Okay, is it just me or did that shot look very different in the trailer? Ooh, it's Mr. Scare Me Not. Ooh, it's Mr. Scare Me Not. You also notice that quite a number of scenes in this movie look very different than they did in the trailer. A ghostly trio. This is an exclusive club, and you ain't invited! Beat it, biped! You don't stare right! Ghosts, what do they know? And here we get a view of what it's like in Ghost World. No, not that Ghost World. All are under the tunes of Oingo Boingo. Here we meet Snivel, a timid small ghost who is voiced by Polly Shore. And just right there, any form of credibility this movie had just went right down the drain. 
We see him awaiting the newcomers at the ghost training station as the train finally comes to a complete stop and he greets them the best way he knows how. I'm Snivel and welcome to our ghost train station. In other words, the station where we train you to be ghosts. Their reactions are pretty much what you'd expect. Okay. Over the next few weeks, you, the rookies, will be learning the A C's of the ghost life. <laughs> what are you looking at? Move! I am Snivel. I told you, keep on moving. We'll march, march, march. You didn't laugh at my jokes. Dude, nobody laughs at your jokes. And the grand total is... Five. Uh -huh. Exactly what kind of measuring standard were you using for these passengers, anyway? Who's missing? Casper? Uh, uh, Did you say missing? Did you run? Since when did gravity apply to ghosts? And we also meet Kibosh, this giant green ghost who's supposedly the leader of this world, and somehow also managed to gain a large fan base for some reason. Especially considering he was made specifically for this piece of shit direct-to-video kids film, actually reappeared in various other incarnations of the franchise that are disconnected with this film. I'm guessing James Earl Jones had something to do with it, perhaps? How would it look if I, the mighty Kibosh, let some wide-eyed rookie run loose without any schooling? Also, you'll notice the running gag on how Kibosh keeps mispronouncing Casper's name. Especially little snot noses named Carter. How about this caster? So, where's Chrysler? Protege can get Brad Capper. Okay, is he just getting Casper's name wrong on purpose? So we learn that the ghostly trio were once disciples of Kibosh. And this is explained for no other reason than to have Kibosh have a beef with something. We then cut to this random scene of Chris running by an old lady, and then Casper trying to have a conversation. Although clearly she seems to lack any sort of peripheral vision, because when she actually turns around and sees him, she sees that he is a ghost and somehow manages to get into the best shape of her life. And then Tim gets orders from the mayor of Deedstown, who is played by Rodney Dangerfield, the other actor from the first Casper movie, only here he looks like he is completely wasted. Drunks, they're nutcases, my wife. And charming, intelligent women. Oh, my wife is very intelligent. It takes her an hour and a half to watch 60 minutes. Well, Rodney, would you mind telling us a little reflection on how things turned out for you after this? I don't get no respect at all. As Chris is about to go into the school, the lead bully comes over and tries to apologize for his previous actions. Since this is a direct-to-video kids movie, the chances of these bullies being complex characters are somewhere around... there-ish. Cut to obvious bully trap in three, two, one... So this has to be the quickest heel face turn I have ever seen. She looks evil for approximately one scene, and in the very next she's suddenly complex? This isn't a case of characterization build, it's a sign of lazy script writing. Or maybe it just might be the fact that she's Joe from Big Bad Beetleborgs. In fact, could this simply be Saban using this as a commercial for some of their other productions? Which could explain that lineup of action figures we've seen earlier. And after the principal supposedly takes the bullies into some sort of boot camp, Chris is then taken to a teacher's lounge? His fistograph then looks at the TV set seeing a news report featuring Tim Carson. Uh, hi. Uh, wow. Well, uh, TV well, cameras uh, aren't usually so flattering. Okay, let's see how long it'll be till we get together. He then starts talking about how we have to tear down the walls of the past in order to seek out the future. Which makes Spistograph very angry. Mainly in an attempt to create some sort of conflict. That weasel! Well, Buster, I'm gonna have another rally, see? You haven't heard the last of Sheila Spistograph! <laughs> 